A count speed, B count speed, C count speed, sound speed. That doesn't feel right. Fuck it. I'm just going to keep going. Sound speed. Brother Kitten Music Edition featuring Sam. Actually, this was supposed to be a tech edition because Sam does something really cool when it comes to the way she releases her music through on the Web3, blockchain, NFTs, all that good noise. But in this video, we talk about how she actually made a tradition, not tradition, sorry, transition from one to another to a website to so her fans can have better access to her music and support what she is doing. Something I do want to note is, again, changed a bit the way the set look, but this is pretty much how it's going to look going forward with little minor adjustments, but I felt very good about how this looks. Just a little minor details. I don't even know if any of you are, are going to know this much, but I did. I care. So anyways, enjoy. Oh, well, I keep doing this. I swear this is not something that uh, kicked this down table. Please know that if you feel I can do something better, put a comment down there say so please feel free to share your ideas about this i i like to when i create something especially like this because it's ever going it's also open to feedback i fucking love feedback so please if you have any thoughts feel free to share them below comment what they say sometimes too comment like share Never thought I'd be a guy to say some shit like that. But turns out that does fucking help. And support helps. Goes a long way. I'm going to make these videos either way it goes. But still, though, it feels a little good to be like, ah, such and such let me know they saw that video. Cool. Thank you, pal. Appreciate you. Appreciate you all, matter of fact. Watch the damn video. I have always been in music. I just came into this world, into my mother's womb singing. I just, that's just always been it for me. Music and, and poetry and visual art um, since I was a little kid. You ha what is your earliest memory of music? Uh, church, choir. Yep, being in choir since the second that I could stand on a stage. <laughs> oh, really? Yep. <laughs> yeah. What was your position in the choir? Uh, I mean... I went to a school in a church that had like a very lively chorus and choir. And so we had church songs, obviously, but then um, our chorus would produce like musicals and and um, recitals and things like that. And I was always just going for, you know, the biggest parts and anything that I could get. I just loved singing. Did your parents nurture that? Absolutely. Especially my mom. Yeah. My mom is so supportive to this day of everything I create, even the stuff that's like really far out there or like really sexual or whatever. My mom is my biggest supporter. So was your household a very musical household? Not necessarily at all. I mean, my mom and my dad to a certain extent, or my stepdad, they both liked music. My mom really liked music. And so I did grow up with a lot of very taste and she was always very supportive and very, you know, listen to whatever you want. And I know like she grew up in a small kind of in like town and small environment, but her parents still supported her going to the record store and buying any kind of music that she wanted. So there was a lot of freedom in that and support in that, but they weren't like, no one was pursuing music in the household. What kind of music was being played in the household? My mom, um, everything from like Janis Joplin, Carole King, um, a lot of like Otis Redding, Al Green. Um, I really like my mom had like a super special taste for soul that she sought out when she was a kid. Um, and I got to grow up with that in a home that I'm super grateful for. Aretha Franklin is like one of my favorite. I still to this day, I'm just like always on repeat with Aretha Franklin tracks. And my mom, I definitely got this quality from my mom. And I think it's just my own independent quality as an artist. When I find something that I like, I will just listen to it again and again and again and again and again and again. So my mom and I would just like listen to a lot of the same music growing up too, which meant that I could really study it and really listen to it um, and really feel it. So, yeah. Do you pick up lyrics really well in music? Definitely, because I am a poet. Uh, again, like poetry and music and visual art are all such innate languages in me and... I care so deeply about words on so many levels. And we could take that to like 
a spiritual conversation or like wherever we want to take that conversation, but words to me are so important. Um, and so hearing words and songs and like learning words has always been very easily for me in songs and hearing words is really important to me. What were some of the lyrics when you were, that? what was the lyric that you remember like you have the earliest memory of that you really gravitated towards? Um, I'll just be honest, the first thing that popped in my mind was actually Spice Girls. So tell me what you want, what you really, really want. And that whole song, um, it's, a song. It's, it's got a lot of empowerment vibes to it. Yes. And I really resonated with that song as a kid. I was just like always singing that song. Um, also, also pretty much all, like Janis Joplin is probably one of my mom's like favorite. And the Beatles were also like, core staple in the household and so a lot of those lyrics I actually have a Beatles tattoo on me like a lot of those lyrics um and kind of like the more poetic the in nature the lyric um like the more deeply it hits with me um let it be was one that always really really stuck with me was it so it was music that got you before poetry or was it the other way around or all at the same time, because okay. like I grew up, literally grew up singing. Like I, those are some of my earliest memories of singing or like being in, a, being in, on stage, and that was my request, and also just like the opportunities that I had. Um, and so I loved every moment of that. And I don't even remember how young I was when I started writing poetry, but it was like very, very young. Like I remember reading a poem in I don't know whatever grade that you learn to read, and I was like, that, that's what I want to do. Um, and so I just started right away with writing poetry. Do you remember the first thing you wrote? Um, I don't remember all of the context, but I remember that I was like very artfully describing like a snowy wintry day. And I spent like a long time like just describing the snow and the cold and the ice and it looked like crystals or whatever. And I was probably in like third grade or something. And I just like had my mom sit on the couch and I just read her <laughs> this description. What was Do you remember her thoughts on it? She, she specifically noted how descriptive it was and said, like, was very encouraging saying that, like, well, writers think like that. They think very descriptively. I resonated with that. Did you have any other people in your life that was as encouraging or somewhat on the same level as your mom was? I mean, no one's on the same level as my mom, yeah. but uh, I've, I have had a lot of trauma growing up, but I've had a lot of support growing up in other ways. And the, one of the ways where I'm so blessed to receive support is everyone around me really did always support my, my creativity and my intellectual pursuits. I was getting my master's for a while, and I'm very intellectual and philosophical person. Um, what were you getting your master's in? I was getting it in special education. My undergrad was in gender and women's studies and critical race theory. And I was kind of like combining all of those, th all of those things, like things on disability and race and gender um, and kind of going down like a philosophical academia route for a while. Um, and I love that. It really feeds my soul. And ultimately, I am an artist. Those are just my like codes. It's just my identity. It's just what it is. Um, and eventually it got to the place where I was like, I don't want to do this and I need to do this with my life, but I'm still very intellectual and philosophical and I still pursue those things and I put them into my art. It's just that I'm not doing it like in an academy anymore. What caused the shift? Um, I had a, like, I was, it's kind of a very classic story of like people in our generation, I think of just like working so hard and like burning out and like burning all the candles at the end, all the ends. And then just getting to a place where I'm like, I have actually reached what people have called a burnout. Like I'm here, I've done it. Um, and I, at the same time, was starting to open to, go ahead. Now, when was that burnout? Uh, I was like, uh, it was just a little bit before I started, started to pursue my art professionally. So it would have been like seven years ago because like mm -hmm. five and a half years ago is when I started really getting serious about my, like making my art my full-time gig. Um, and it was, around the same time that I was also coming back into spirituality I was like very um atheist for a long time and very like kind of my dogmas were more around like social politics like feminism and things like that like that's where I invested my like consciousness and philosophical pursuits um and then I around the same time that I started having like a full-on breakdown I started rediscovering because it was very present when I was a kid different spiritual spirituality, just consciousness, evolution, um, different practices, tantra, witchcraft, like all the things I just dove in. Um, and so those things were happening at the same time of like me burning out from this one life that I was leading of going to grad school and working full time and being really just like 
in that world and also still trying to feed my creative soul. And so I was like performing burlesque and um, doing some poetry readings and stuff, but I hadn't made the shift to like really making my music. Um, even though I'd been writing it for a long time, I had a lot of insecurities around it. Um, and so as I was coming through this like full breakdown and burnout um, and coming into like different ways of existing and different ways of prioritizing um, my needs and my creativity, I did like a really fast 180. I like quit my job, dumped my boyfriend, moved. Like I did all the things um, and like moved got from super, where to where? From Tucson to Sedona. Gotcha. That, and Sedona's my hometown. Um, that's where I was born. My mom and my sister still live there. Um, and then we spent, I spent a lot of time in Tucson and then I moved back home to Sedona for a few years. But ultimately I knew I was coming out to LA. I thought I was going to go to home to Sedona for like six months. Um, and then COVID happened and it was the perfect, perfect timing for me to be there with my family and in a space that was really spacious and connected to nature and really open and like really fertilized my creative juices. So you, so there was a period of time where you weren't as active in music where you weren't writing and recording? I wasn't recording. I was like, I've pretty much always been writing music. I have like, I don't even know how many hundreds of pages of like lyrics and poetry, mm -hmm. but I wasn't performing it and I wasn't recording it. And part of that is because I really went hard down this like train of academia and I just didn't see, like I couldn't make those things fit together. Um, and I also felt very like uneducated about how to like really create music outside of like writing lyrics. Like that's what I do. And I'm a singer and I'm a rapper and that's what I do. But in terms of like finding producers to work with and finding studios and affording all of that stuff, like that part of my journey took a lot longer. Um, but the creative juice was always there. Do you ever feel like you were neglecting a part of yourself as you were pursuing your masters? Oh, a thousand percent. Yeah, there was always this very loud voice inside of me that was just like, all you want to do, Sam, is like smoke weed and write poetry <laughs> and masturbate and talk about cool stuff. Like, I, like that's what I want to do with my life. So I was like, what am I doing then um, here? And there was a lot of pullback. But I also really do love the pursuit of intellectual and philosophical concepts and like I, digging into them. I have like a brain for it and a desire for it. So I was being fed in a lot of ways. Um, and I do know that it's all part of my path because um, deepening into uh, gender frameworks and social justice and critical race theory and um, disability theories and all of these things are hugely important for where I am today. Um, and they absolutely inform my art. But they were right. just the world of academia is so fucking draining. Personally, I, I feel that way. Like, it's just like draining as fuck. And I just didn't want to be there anymore. <laughs> and teaching, like, I loved teaching to an extent, but also, like, it's so underpaid. The, the next thing I did, basically, after I, like, quit everything and I was started reorganizing, I, I became a, a bartender at, like, a fancy wine bar in Sedona. And I was working like 30 hours a week and I was making like double the money that I made as a teacher. And I was like, what lies have I been believing that I was like doing that with my life? Not that it's not important and it was so just and so wonderful, but I was just like living so much happier and I had so much time for my art and I was making so much more money. And I was like, fuck that. Like I never will go back to. <laughs> you know, the way Americans view the military, the veterans uh, supposedly, and uh, the police force, fire department, I feel that they should view teachers the same. Mm -hmm. I know some people do, but when we look at teachers in the act of service that they perform for the greater good of the mm -hmm. community, it should be celebrated much more than it actually is. Of course. Celebrated and compensated. Say, I mean, of course, yeah. compensated uh, fairly. They are so under. Yeah. It's, it's criminal. Yeah, agreed. You said that you're, in, you're insecure mm. about your art. Why is that? Uh, I think that it took me a while to just love my voice. I think that a lot of us have a lot of comparison issues when we're growing up. And, and by the way, just objectively speaking, I do have a very pretty voice. I have a very beautiful voice. I grew up in chorus. I know how to sing. But I always grew up with people who were just like a hair better than me, like constantly, like best friend, better at this, better at this. And, and so I just had this complex for a long time of like, I'm not a good enough singer. 
was the first one. And the other one was more around like, I dated a lot of musicians and I almost like positioned myself where I like locked myself out from the music side and put myself into the category of like the appreciating side and like, like, I don't know, I, I compared my, what I was creating to what other people were creating. And it, it, it felt very like intimidating to be like, Hey, do you want to play music with me? And mm -hmm. Hey, do you want to try these songs? And Hey, do you like, it took me, that was like three years of just self work of, of really getting to a place where the, the joy that I had in creating outweighed the fears that I had around my stuff being of any particular level or being liked by people or being told no by other musicians. It's just kind of like a, that's the, the game we learned to play, you know? And same with like love and romance. It's like, can you accept no's gracefully? Now I can, but before I was sensitive and I would like, it really hurt my feelings if people didn't want to play music with me or whatever. And now I don't care, like, because I know what I want and I know that not everyone is meant to create together. So it's just like, I came into me as a person. So you started out in the church mm -hmm. and then moved away from the church, mm -hmm. and became atheist, mm -hmm. fell out. But you, when you started out in the church, you were in love with music, mm -hmm. performing music, mm -hmm. writing music. Mm -hmm. And then when you went on more so of like college, college, yeah, became an atheist, still writing, but no longer performing. Yeah, performed poetry. Poetry, I got you. Mm -hmm. And then when you kind of came back around to music, you came more spiritual. Yeah, one and the same, totally. Absolutely. And that's because, I mean, for me, um, art is like the clearest channel to our inner sense of divine. And I'll just give like a really brief overview of my sense of spirituality is that like we are all divine beings um, and that there is no separation between what we call God and ourselves as an extension of that source energy. Um, and so when we become in a like humbled but very creative state of channeling um, and also like co-creation it's not just channeling it's like interacting with the energy and putting your d unique yummy flavor with it um, but that's like how divine gets expressed into the world and the most potent form is through art so for me being an art and uh, being an art sure yes absolutely I do see myself as art um, but being an artist is like I take it as upon as like a very important um an archetypal role, like the archetype of the artist is here to help us translate and understand our relationship to divinity as we are that. Um, like that's the role of the artist in society. Like that's what they're supposed to be doing, I believe, on their most core level. Um, and, and lots of things come with that. Um, but so it was inevitable that I was, I was going through really just like my own kind of like black hole of coming into my own unique embodied spirituality, my art and creativity were necessarily like, that is the same process for me. What is that? What is that when we say that we're spiritual, mm -hmm. that people tend to define it, mm. but we don't, but the atheist part, we don't. Mm. Why do you think that is? Mm. Can you expand the question for me? So. You defined for us what you what you mean by when you say spiritual, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I I notice a lot of people do that mm -hmm. when they say that they're spiritual or religious, mm -hmm. they define it mm, to what it means for them. Yes. Yeah. But no one ever does that when they when they say that they are atheists. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah. I wonder. I wonder. I wonder what that is. I wonder if that is a bit of an insecurity, or do we feel that we don't want to scare someone off because mm. of what we believe, even though mm. I, now this is my bubble. Mm -hmm. I remember a time where a lot of people were saying that they were atheists. Mm -hmm. Now, again, in my bubble, that seems to be fewer and fewer people. Mm -hmm. And it also seems to have changed with happiness and depression mm. and people believing it more into themselves as spiritual mm -hmm. that they become, whatever mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. I, um, to me, why someone is spiritual, I've never, I've never questioned it. Mm -hmm. I, I, my, my thing is always, not necessarily like, are you happy? It's how does that make you feel? Mm -hmm. 
I again in my bubble, I know a lot of people that are atheists and not a lot, but I, I know a good deal of people who are atheists mm -hmm. and who may not feel the best for them at, for themselves at that present moment. Now mm -hmm. I know some that that are, but it does seem to be a difference when mm -hmm. someone has something to believe in, someone that that doesn't. Mm. Even though I am kind of glad, again, I'm just talking about my bubble, mm -hmm. where it's the, um, we've probably all met what I like to call the asshole atheist, which is mm -hmm. who treats it as a religion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm like, how can you be so hardcore about mm -hmm. this thing? You just know. Mm -hmm. It's like, to me, it's yeah. like that that sounds like a religion yeah, to me. Exactly. And it does sound yeah. like you are spiritual, even though you're saying that you're, yeah. now, I guess what kind of makes them an ass totally. is a, a bit is because they are, Denying this part of themselves, like obviously you do actually believe in something that yeah. like believing in nothing is believing in yeah. something. But uh. yeah, no, I think that's actually a really fascinating point. And one of the things that came up for me when you said that was, I mentioned earlier I was really into social justice activism for many years in college, in particular around feminist areas. And I realized because I was raised in the church and I was always very zealous about my passion and my love for whatever it is that I was invested in. And then when I went to college, it's like that became the thing that I was invested in. So it was like it did become a dogma. Like it did become my religion, basically, like social. And, and I think that like there are a lot of levels of consciousness and like the sociopolitical is one level. The psychological is another level. The spiritual is another level. And where you're at depends on where you're going to engage each of those things. I believe, ideally, someone is operating on all of those systems and the physical body. And I forgot to mention that, the physical body too, and the emotional body. Like, hopefully we're operating on all of those layers with, like, ma growing maturity and evolution. And if someone has decided that they're, quote, unquote, not spiritual, I often see what ends up happening is they are still seeking out or receiving that same kind of experience, but they're just not calling it spiritual. They might call it their connection to nature or they might call it right. their connection to their art. Like one of my past partners, he says he's not at all spiritual, but I hear the music he creates and he's still creating from that place. He's tapping it, that like unnameable thing that we tap, he's tapping it, right? So it's like, even if, and we don't all need to code it the same way. Um, we were talking about that earlier with diets. It's like our diets are as unique as our individual selves. Like our spiritual as desires are as, are, and are as unique as our individual selves. Mm -hmm. So I love that for people. I do find with a lot of people, and I definitely put myself in this category when I was identifying as atheist, that I wasn't expressing what is to me an actual like spirit or soul work that we need to do. Um, and so sometimes you can see those people become a little bit like what I would call is like spiritually stunted. Like maybe they're not really concerned about like, for me, I'm very concerned about what my soul is doing here in this lifetime and like the work that it's doing and what I'm learning and what my lessons are. And it gives me context and meaning and purpose, which what back to what you said about like, how do you feel? That's really what we're talking about anyway. Right. Like I have the motivation on a daily basis to do my work with love and joy in my heart because even if I'm the one creating it, it has purpose. Um, and so I think when we can map our purpose in with like our spirit and our soul, then we're like just living a happier life and we're like more in alignment with what brings us that happiness. Yes, it, it, human beings need purpose, especially human beings who don't have children. When you have mm -hmm. a child, it's, it's, it's right there. Your purpose is embodied in a human being. Sure. You, you know, Protect your child, raise your child, give the child the the best of you, mm -hmm. right? But when you don't have that, it's like, okay, then what is your purpose? What is that thing that is more important than you? Yep. Because it's very hard to see something that's more important than you in, until you have a child. But if you make the decision not to have children, then it's like, okay, then what is that thing that is more important than you? Because yeah. When you don't have that thing, then you will get lost. Totally. Yeah. I had my tubes tied, by the way. My children in this lifetime are my are my artworks. <laughs> That's the way I see it. It's, uh, I mean, I don't yeah. have my tubes tied. But <laughs> <laughs> it just seems relevant. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm 39 years old. I don't have I don't have children. not saying I won't have children yeah. one day. It's just something I, I don't even uh, think about, I, yeah. honestly. But I do think about what is more important than me. Yeah, I know exactly. in my own personal journey, 
it's when I don't have sight of that, that is when I am most lost. Yep, totally. And that is a, that is a very similar thing that I see to, on to others. Mm -hmm. and I, I feel when people don't have that actualized, they, they almost want to spread the disease of how they feel. Totally. Of lostness to, yep. to other people. Or sometimes yep. this is how we also see people pick up causes that they are not really into, but they want everyone to feel the same about the causes they do. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, wait, yeah. what? Like, what is what is yeah. happening right now, yeah. you know? And that's, like, just, a, again, like, a soul that needs some work. And yes. so, like, by avoiding the spiritual labor, it's like you're avoiding the exact thing that you need to be focusing on right now. <laughs> right. And it's, it is very hard to get there. But then I say it's harder to to keep denying it, to keep lying to yourself. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, but back to music. Yeah. Yeah, well, and one of the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, how... So when it came to art and music, how did you get before... Actually, not, let's not talk music right now. Let's, okay. let's talk tech. Yeah, totally. Let's talk tech. How did you find your way to tech? Uh, just in the last few years, I was never, well, okay. I have always been a tech person to the extent that I am a visual artist and I've always been into digital art. I've always been into the combination of photo, like photography and videography mixed with post-production, cool, like, an, like when I say animation, I don't mean like cartoon, but like bringing things to life, um, kind of vibes. And I've always been doing that even when I was a little kid, um, but that was pretty much my extent to my relationship with tech, except for like this simple stuff that like everyone is, you know, in on, whatever. Um, but I am a digital artist and NFTs, when they first started coming out, I didn't, I was a little bit late to the game, but not too late. And then I saw lots of things that I didn't like, um, but I saw that for the first time ever, People were paying money for digital art and calling it real art and calling it fine art. And as a fine artist and a digital artist, I can't tell you how frustrating it was for many, many years to be selling my artwork for maybe 60 fucking dollars when I knew that it was worth like $600 based on where I was and what I was creating. But because people didn't have like a codified, hadn't codified digital art as being in the fine art category. It's like, well, why would I pay $60 for a digital copy of something? was kind of people's mindset a few years ago. And now that's rapidly shifting. Um, so that was my first curiosity point about NFTs. And then the more that I learned, the more that I was a fuck yes. Um, and I, like I said, I used to be a teacher and it's very, teaching is very natural for me. So I kind of immediately started doing things like putting together, um, you know, like a PowerPoint presentation for intro to NFTs for artists. I have an intro to Web3 class that I posted on my YouTube channel. Um, I did some workshops with people, some one-on-one -on -one consulting. Um, and that, for me, it's always helpful to be in a teaching role because then it forces you to learn what you need to learn in order to teach it. So um, I learned quite a bit over the last few years, but I still honestly feel like I'm a novice just because it's always constantly evolving. It's so brand new and there's so much to know. So I by no means consider myself like an expert, but I am always learning more and I'm committed to the space. Um, so that was my first experience. I have sold some NFTs, some artwork and some music NFTs, but not like super, you know, crazy successful. I think that just like any other site or technology or platform or whatever that you're using, it's like the energy that you're putting into finding your audience on that platform that really makes the sales, not the tool or the technology itself. Um, so I can, excited to continue to put effort into developing in that niche. Um, but I also just had some like pretty big decisions that I changed with my album direction. I don't know if you want to like, if you want me to jump into that, but. Before that, how has it been finding your audience on, when, when it comes to, all right, it's the audience we find in real life. Yeah. It's the audience we find in the virtual world or the social media world. And mm -hmm. now you're saying the audience that you find in the NFT and Web3 world. How? Yeah. Has that audience been compared to the other two? I have mixed experiences with it. On the one hand, and 
I think part of that mixed experience is just that I am an independent artist and an event producer and a mystic and an energy worker and I have a lot of things on my plate. So if I had like, if I just put more focus on X, Y, Z things, I think it would breed more results. So I'll just start with that because I also like take accountability. It's not like I expect to pop off anywhere on TikTok, Instagram, anywhere, unless I put the work into making that happen. Um, but the the really positive thing that I noticed about delving in with the Web3 community right away um, is that people and artists in general are very supportive and collaborative. The Web3 and NFT world is still a very, very small world, a very, very, very small world. And I've been in it for a while now. And so uh, it's just like, we want more people to come into the space. We want artists to succeed. We want each other to have resources and things in the space. So people are super freaking nice, like, and so responsive. And um, that's one thing that off the bat, and I still say to this day, is like one of the most welcoming communities from that perspective um, of like really answering questions and supporting artists and welcoming people in. The other thing that's, um, again, just makes it a little bit easier because it is still a small community. It's easier to get to know people faster. Like, um, especially there's a few, I'm on the Cardano blockchain primarily. We don't need to necessarily talk about that details unless we want to, but um, ahead, I, I picked the Cardano blockchain because for me, I'm a very community-based person. And, and what is that? Oh, yes. Okay. So a blockchain, um, there are so many different kinds of blockchains, including Ethereum, Bitcoin, Solana, Tezos, blah, blah, blah. So there's so many different kinds. I found Cardano, um, or rather Cardano kind of found me, but I wanted to align with places that are one, very focused on community and two, very focused on integrity and what are we doing with our tech. For me, it's not enough to just be engaged in like a, a thing that's like, cool, we're being successful and we're making money. I'm like, cool, but where's that money going? What are we doing with it? What's the point of it? Where's your integrity? That's the kind of shit that I'm really interested in investing in. Because I know long term, I'm going to be successful no matter where I plant my flag because I know that about myself. So it's like, where do I want my success to be in? What kind of culture? And Cardano for me is the most high key about like, we have this project that's going to be, you know, lifting up artists in this part of the world. And we have so many philosophical considerations about the ethics of this. And we have like, it's just popping off with thoughtful people who are really intentional about their work. So just that alone resonated with me. And then it's, it's probably true that there are other really thriving music cultures and other blockchains. That's probably true. I, I just personally have do dive, dove, Dove and div, dive div, <laughs> into Cardano, and it's really popping. Like, there's just multiple Twitter spaces with from pro, Web3 projects that are all about Web3 music. And I mean, talk about community. Like, it was just so cool. And I got to finally meet some of those people um, at, I performed at NFT Las Vegas this year. Um, and I got to meet some of the people that I've been like communicating with in, in communities online. And that was a really exciting experience. Um, so the community, the integrity, the intentionality behind the blockchain is what drew me to Cardano. Nice, nice, nice. So you said that the feedback from the people has been pretty positive. Yeah, um, of course, like I have haters, like anyone has haters, right, but I, I, I continue to be, feel very supported. Right. We're always just gonna ignore a lot the haters, of the, the haters yeah. right? But, but what, when, but different communities give different type of criticism back and, and constructive criticism back. Yeah, and so you find that there you get good constructive criticism. Yeah, the most of my constructive criticism that I've gotten around there has been around tech stuff. Um, like my last drop, you could access it from this wallet, but not from this location. And someone from my community who bought my NFT took the time and effort to reach out to me in person and say, hey, I bought your NFT, but I wanted you to know that this was my experience with it and you may want to consider doing this for your next drop. Loved that feedback so much. Um, what do your drops consist of? Yeah, so uh, right now, m everything that I'm doing is related to my album. Um, and this might be a good place actually to talk about the change that I just made. Sure. Okay, so for the last year, because this, let me actually back up and talk about Rose Riot. Okay, um, so Rose Riot is the name of the visual album, and it is a multimedia, multidimensional project. It's not just the music. So visual album, every song has a music video. Um, it has collaborative artwork that I've 
worked on with other people. That's like these digital surrealistic worlds. Um, it has physical artwork paintings that can be purchased in addition to the actual album. There's behind the scenes content. Um, I created a meditation guidebook and lyric book. Um, the album Rose Riot is broken up by the seasons. It's like each season is a chapter. And each season is really meant to help us hone and master the energies of like it's a part of us. Like we are a part of nature and these are the four seasons and these are the four energies. And it's like when we focus on those energies, including even what diet is best in the winter versus the spring, um, what kind of exercise is best in the, in the winter versus the spring, um, but also more like metaphysically, like winter is very much about going inward and being a hermit and being still. Spring is very much about like activation, rebirth, sexuality, coming out, right? So like when we're in alignment with the seasons then we can be in alignment with our natural cycles, which I put forth as like something that can help us be in embodiment, enlightenment and you know, nirvana, whatever words that we wanna use around that. Um, so the album was initially intentioned. It's been a year long project. I started Spring Equinox last year. It launches March 19th this year. Um, was to do the full thing as an NFT and just basically have everything that I just said, but available exclusively as an NFT. And just recently, I changed my mind. Um, I am still gonna do NFT drops related to the album. I, I have this very specific artwork that I have set aside that I've worked on and that I'm collaborating on. And those are gonna be like really limited edition um, drops that you can get on the platform that I've been collaborating with called Sound Rig. They're amazing. Um, and so I'm thinking of like ramping up the album sales and dropping those in the summer. But I realized that one, I just, flat out know that I will have significantly more sales, especially right off the bat, if I drop it as a regular, something that people can purchase on my website, as opposed to having to have people go in and get crypto and buy and trade it. Because even if you buy that crypto, you need to get ADA because you're purchasing it on Cardano and all this stuff. Like, I don't even like doing that shit. Like, I have only made a few purchases of NFTs because I don't, the user experience is fucking annoying and not very easy. And if you are someone who's like a little bit nervous about like, I don't know, whatever. There's just a lot of things that I don't even resonate with about it. And so I want the user experience to really be there before I launch a huge ass project. Like if I'm gonna do a couple things or whatever and I already know that I have like a niche here and a couple collectors in the Web3 space, awesome. And if I can inspire people to come into the space, do some education around that, inspire people to come buy my NFT work, awesome, who you know wouldn't have bought it otherwise. But I want this album to be incredibly accessible. I want there to be no roadblocks. And some of the reasons that I ultimately invest in like long-term NFTs aren't really applicable for me as an artist yet. For example, one of the benefits of NFTs is like no one's gonna be able to like copy and you know send your album out to another person. Like it's safe, it's secure, you have your only edition. By selling it on my website, I'm opening up the door for people to potentially like copy my stuff and send it to friends or whatever, get it, get it without paying for it. But honestly, I'm still an emerging artist and like the more eyes on my art, the better. So like if I don't get every single $44 sale, but people are still seeing and enjoying my artwork, for me, that's okay right now. Right. I'll feel differently perhaps in a few years, but like I'm okay with that right now. I mean, it's important as artists that we recognize where we're at in our career. Sometimes yep. we have a nasty habit of putting the big dog's problems on us. It's yeah. like, yes, our our quality of our art may be that, but where we're at in our career is not that. Yep. And so at times, hey, somebody even rip, somebody copying and sending it to their friends is great promotion exactly. for That's what us, I'm saying. right? Yeah. But then on top of that, at this stage, the people that we are more likely to encounter are people who want us to succeed. Yeah. And so we'll exactly. encourage others to do that. And so it's just like, why are we putting certain protections against us that we don't necessarily have to worry about that would actually scare off people from purchasing our work? I, Cause I can tell you, if it takes three clicks for me to get to something, I, I may be lost right exactly. there. There was something that happened when it came to, um, Dave Chappelle, most deaf and titled Kweli, has a podcast. Mm -hmm. And I believe they put it on Lunar or something or whatever. Mm -hmm. it's, last I checked, it wasn't the most, it wasn't the easiest to get to. Mm -hmm. And even though I 
did enjoy their podcast, it was, hey, I'm not going to go download this other app to get to download this thing to listen to your thing yep. that th that drops an episode, I don't know, one every three weeks or so, even yep. though, again, phenomenal podcast. Yep. Recommend people check it out. Yeah, but yeah, I don't even I know it. if they still do it. Yep. So. Yeah, and I feel the same way about my stuff, and I just had to get real with myself because for a minute I was very invested in the idea of like having the first visual album on the blockchain and like I'm so dedicated to the space like everyone come into the space with me but like I've been in the space for years and I've still only had like a dozen sales you know like I really am focused holistically on my journey as an artist and not just like becoming an NFT enthusiast and I'm planting my own flags and all of that court you know it's <laughs> mixed metaphors Unless that's what you want to be. It's, it's right. like we have to remember totally. what like what are we? Exactly. And I know for me that right now, at this stage of my career, I'm more interested in like gaining notoriety all across the board than putting a lot of energy in developing a niche audience in the NFT space. Even though I am still doing that. It's just that I want to be more comprehensive than that. So how do you help your audience find you? That's a good question. Uh, I mean, uh, I love giving interviews. That's probably one of my favorite things to do. Um, I love to show up to Twitter spaces where they have like, they have a lot of like music programs and stuff. Um, and you just like submit your songs and you listen to everyone's and you can comment and it's just like a super fun kind of like homey hang music who thing. Who the fuck so calls I love it X, that. right? What? Like I love that you said Twitter oh, spaces. Yeah. No, 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 fuck that. Like who the fuck calls it X? I don't even, Like yeah. no one does. Ah. No one still does. Even when I was uh, watching Elon do an interview where he kept referring to it as uh, X, firmly known as Twitter. It's like... Even he, yeah, exactly. He doesn't like, even call it just what X. The fuck, what I, yeah. I, I would never I call it remember. X. Like, that's not <laughs> happening. Like, the only good thing about it being called X is if I'm typing in a web, web browser, I don't have to use one letter. That's true. That's true. Yeah. For me, it just immediately sounded like it was like a like a dirty thing, like X. Like, that sounds like a porn thing. I don't know. That's just where I... Which it also <laughs> is. People don't, are not really, they're not aware that when the, the fall of Tumblr, mm -hmm. people don't recognize that Tumblr was a very large sex positive place. Mm. That a lot, gee, a lot of people who were assigned female at birth were going to for their pornography. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of like pornography that was geared towards them. Yeah. And then I know Tumblr still exists, mm. but that part no longer exists. Mm. So that crowd just went to Twitter. Yeah, makes sense. Where it's still allowed today. Yeah. And then so in so many ways it being called X is it is appropriate. appropriate. Yeah. Yes, because <laughs> very much so. Because there has been times too where I'm looking and I'm like, oh, why is that trending? And then you scroll down and then some asshole posts something that has nothing to do with the subject and it's yeah. just like that's not cool. I didn't want to yeah, see yeah, yeah. that. So yeah, that part they need to do something about. But the sex positivity side of yes. things, very glad Agreed. that that is a thing that still exists and on a major social media Totally app agreed. Totally agreed. That yeah. no one seems to talk about though. It's a yeah. very it's a very weird thing where yeah. People want folks to get canceled or taken off for saying certain things, mm. but no one talks about <laughs> mm. the um, the porn side yeah. of it, or even the graphic violence side mm -hmm. of it Interesting. on all social media apps, right? Yeah. Because all damn near all social media apps show intense graphic violence, yeah. which I'm very fortunate that I don't see in my algorithm. Like I never see none of that yeah, stuff because I'm never clicking on any of that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Occasion yeah. fight video, but I make sure <laughs> to kind of wipe that, but yeah. Because it's like I'm not not trying to see random fight videos yeah. pop up in my algorithm. Yeah, heck yeah. Agreed. Yeah. So you said Twitter spaces has been a good has been something that you've used to help your audience find you. Mm -hmm. Twitter spaces, podcast interviews, TikTok has actually been super helpful. I kind of resisted TikTok for a while because I don't like the formatting. I still don't. Um, but I, I invested in it this year and I've had a lot of success on, or I mean, whatever, a lot of success. I've had a lot more views. Like for me, the most important thing is like, does it translate to people going to my Spotify, going to my website, going to that? And does it? That's the most important thing for me. 
TikTok for me has been the most translated. Really? Like I so literally it has turned into views. I mean, to like, my Spotify uh, streams and followers, okay. the the biggest conversions that I've had on any other on any other platform. Nice, nice, yeah. nice. I had a friend. She has a uh, she has a, her own clothing brand. She was saying that even though her Instagram numbers may appear to be one thing, they didn't really translate to uh, clothes being purchased. Yeah. Unlike her YouTube subscriptions, it's like. Mm. She was saying she had probably like one tenth the views of a video on YouTube, but the people from there were way more likely to buy something than those Interesting. on uh, Instagram. It's good to hear. Yeah, I, mean, I actually just came from a meeting this morning, a consultation meeting where I was talking about some of this stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, I like again being an independent artist is like you're juggling so many things. So there's so many, so much um, area for growth that I'm really excited to explore more in 2024, including more professional PR and marketing. Um, the other biggest way that I get new followers and things and, and expose my music is through performing. Um, I, 2024, I am going super hard on my performance calendar and I produce events. Um, I produce uh, I'm a part of a, a production company called Enchanted Loft Productions. Um, we do an event like once every couple months. Um, me and my friend Tori started it, so we almost always perform. Um, so there's like always an awesome big crowd there that we get to connect with. Um, and then just, you know, like community vibing. Nice. Yeah. Talk. Let's talk more about your production company and yeah. your loft events. Mm -hmm. So you say they happen once every couple About. We have five scheduled in 2024. What days of the week do they typically fall? Saturdays. Saturdays. We started on Thursday nights because we wanted, we started young, obviously. We, we just celebrated our one-year anniversary in December. Mm -hmm. um, but we started on Thursdays to make it more of like a chill thing that we weren't really competing, you know. Um, but now we're doing like full like micro festivals. We start in the afternoon on Saturdays and go all the way through late night um, and have like really cool activations during the day. Actually in February, um, we booked all black performers and artists and panelists and facilitators and we're having a conversation on um, how artists are alchemizing racism through creativity. And then we have a spiritual healing um, around two of our facilitators who are gonna be just doing some like lineage clearing and like helping us release and heal around that. Um, and then we have a dope open mic and then the rest of the night's always just like dope music and art. So the, the day activations are always a little bit different, but the night is always awesome music and art, DJs, projection why? art. But why in February? Black History Month is why it came up. Right. Yeah. But why not a different month with the same idea? Yeah, that's a valid point. And actually our creative director had the same perspective. We were just split and then we had a lot of momentum going toward organizing it already and we were partnered with someone already. So we just rolled with it. But super valid point of perspective. Yeah. So, why, what I was getting at when it came to backtracking just a little bit mm -hmm. about the day in the week because I figured it was Saturday, uh -huh. and but you say it start now in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Smart mm -hmm. because I know there was someone who's never been to one of those events because of the time they started. Yes. Yes, because I'm a person that is in bed at 10 p.m. at yes. night, and yo, y'all were having them start yeah, around nine. Around. Yeah, exactly. Right, and my pushback against that because. Well, I'm noticing with a lot of events, they are starting much earlier. Because mm -hmm. I'm because my thing is, it's like, hey, people, it's a Saturday, which for a lot of people already isn't a work day. Mm -hmm. Why are we starting this thing at 9 p.m.? Like, what the hell are we doing beforehand? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, wait a minute. chilling? <laughs> a lot of people are waiting to go to something late at night. It's like, yeah. wait a minute. You could have been partying this whole time, but instead yeah. you waited. And I'm like, ah, because I'm an early riser kind of person. And I know there's a lot of people that's like that. Mm -hmm. I just went to an event a few weeks ago where it was packed. Mm, and it nice. started at 12 p.m. Heck yes, love that. And I was like, it's great that pe more and more people are realizing, it's like, okay, daytime events is where totally it's Totally agree. Yeah, and we like the day to night transition because it's right. like two totally different crowds and energies. Exactly, yeah. where you let the people decide. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, so those have been going really well. We just expanded our team. We added a creative director um, and someone who is really leading up both our consent um, education. We want to be really, really established and known as like the safest dance floor on LA, in LA. Um, having an environment where, because I come from like burner communities and play party communities and kink communities and things like that. And so do some of the other producers on our team. And like having a clearly articulated culture around not just like incent, but like enthusiastic care for the people that are in the environment. 
truly makes a fundamental difference for the environment. We also don't serve alcohol. We have cool elixirs and kavas and like different kinds of neurotropic beverages that bring different things. We also have psychedelic experiences there if people would like to engage in those. But we do know alcohol. Um, and that's also another reflection of like our commitment to consent forward space. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the team. Smart. I am a person, what is it, this is going on 15 or 16 months or whatever the hell mm -hmm. for me, uh, not drinking alcohol. Nice. Um, but I do a thing where, cause I, I'm a psychedelics person. Mm -hmm. So psych the psychedelics I most vibe with is LSD, mushrooms, and pure MDMA. Gotta say pure MDMA because a lot of people yes. think they get press pills MDMA and like, that's like, no, 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 no. Let it be rocks. Yes. Bust it down your damn self. And so what I do is like a, a margarita, uh, an MDMA infused margarita. So instead of the tequila and, or whatever the other alcohol, it's yeah. MDMA yeah. instead. And that's a way better time. We were on a microdose. super similar vibe. That's like literally, those are my three favorite psychedelics. And literally that's what I do. I don't make a margarita version, but I just like to mix it in with like a sweet drink and then just like drink it throughout the night. Because then you can control the release too. Yes. It's my favorite. Yes, yep. yes. Um, explain to the people what a play party is. Yeah, um, a play party is somewhere that um, you are invited to go express and explore and experience all different kinds of sexual desires, pleasures, kinks. Um, it's, uh, again, a very safe space. Every play party that I've been a part of always has like a very clear consent talk beforehand and gives people clear, helpful tools in case they're new to that environment to ask Hey, may I explore? May I watch? Would you like to play? And, you know, being very specific around that kind of stuff. So it's just like a very open, I often too find this, and this is kind of like an interesting topic that we could go on a side thing about, but I'll just mention it. Like they're also just very playful. Like it's a play party. Like they're fun. It's almost like childlike. Like the way that I express myself there is like, I'm just having a blast. Like I'm having fun. Like put the dicks in my face. Like we're just having a part. Like it's just fun, you know? Like that's what I'm about is just like spaces that allow you to just like divest the shame from your sexuality. Know that it's like pleasure is our liberation. It's our, you know, God-given right. Um, you know, so like, and I've just recently got into more um, doing what I call is like nourishing doming. Oh, thank you. What I call nourishing doming. Um, and so it's like doming people, but not, I'm not like a very, like, I don't like to inflict intense pain. Like, that's just not really my flavor. I don't like to receive that either. But I've been like playing with new floggers and just like bringing people to kind of like a different subspace where it's just like a very nurturing experience. And play parties are the best place to do that because it's like, I want to explore this desire. My partner may or may not be interested in that, but either way, like, I want to like practice. Like, I want to just like see it as an art and be able to offer that to people. And like for me, honestly, too, I'm not even receiving like sexual pleasure out of it. I'm just like in service. Um, and and that's also a part of my like role as like a mystic and an energy worker is I like to just like be in service and help people like heal their body soul relationship. Um, and so like being a nourishing dom, which is what I've been exploring recently, like allows me to do that in a way that feels really safe for other people because I'm explicitly not getting like sexual pleasure out of your pleasure like the whole experience is just curated around like your healing your pleasure your desires um yeah so i love play parties they've been so instrumental in my life for helping me heal and come into pleasure and come into play safety mm -hmm. like i'm glad that you mentioned safety yeah and i i've been to a few play parties and i felt very safe at mm -hmm. the ones that i that i've been to but there's also two seem to be a more advanced way mm -hmm. out there of people who are throwing these events yep. than there had been before in the past. And that's just a thing, a beauty about society changing um, for the better. But yep. that still isn't, but there, that, that doesn't mean people still should not be um, look, looking out for the dangers. Absolutely. Um, yeah, two thoughts on that. One, the Burning Man camp that I'm a part of is called bed euro of erotic discourse and they do all of the consent education for burning man um and for for me it's about creating a culture where like it's so normalized like now i'm at a place where it's so i'm it's such a blessing because this is not regular culture's experience but like at the play party that i was at recently like just everyone is practiced and asking even if they can hug even if they can like and it's not weird and it's not uncomfortable it's just practice because sometimes like 
I may know you, but I'm not might not be in a mood and it has nothing to do with you. I just don't even want to hug you. Or like, I might be naked and that's like an experience for me. I don't want to hug you. You know, so it's just like becoming more practice and versed and, and comfortable around just that being the normal is normalized society is just like seeking consent, being enthusiastic, accepting no's gracefully, like thanking people for saying no, because it means they honored their boundary, which we want to celebrate, you know, like I'm really about celebrating people's no's and yeah. Because if it's not a hell, yes, it's a fuck no. Exactly. That's right. the thing for bed, too. Yes. And this is the other thing that I'm really, really enjoying with play parties recently is I just started performing at them. And so for my acts, because I've done so many different kinds of performances, and just recently I've really been trying to combine my performance acts. And so I'm doing music, I'm doing my projection art, and I'm doing burlesque. Um, and so I love performing at play parties because it's the only environment that I've encountered so far where I can get all the way naked on stage, um, which I don't know why I love doing that, but I do. Like, I don't know, why do you love doing burlesque? It's just like fucking fabulous taking your clothes off and like being a sensual, you know, like art portal for people. Um, and so being able to take all of my clothes off and just be like fully liberated and fully naked on stage and singing my songs has been so yummy. I've done three performances for, so far like that, and I'm obsessed, and I do want to create a little niche for myself of playing at play parties. <laughs> do you feel when you're able to um, perform at play parties in the nude versus performing on stage where clothed, mm -hmm. right, that somehow when you're performing at play parties that the shackles are off of you, or is it a different type of liberation? Yeah, I think it's like, um, I'm personally, and not even necessarily politically, because my my work is really channeled through like art and music and business and money. Those are my politics. Um, so I don't even mean this politically, but I am like a big free the nipple person. Like I just, th I think it's so fucking stupid. The other day I was on a walk and I just wanted to take my fucking sports bra off because it was hot and it was beautiful out and I wanted to stretch and be free and I couldn't. And that made me so fucking mad. And I have multiple moments like that often where I'm just like in society and I'm just like, this is stupid. Do you um, know about the first free the nipple movement a hundred years ago? No. Oh, you don't know about this? No. So about a hundred years ago or over, there was a free the nipple movement by men mm. because it used to be illegal for men to be topless on a beach in America. And then they march for their right to be topless on the beach. And this is why now men can be topless on the beach. It was not always the case in America. I did not know that. Look this up. It's a wild thing. It's a wild Whoa, thing to see men Thank you for educating march me. Yeah. About for freeing the, ability the nipples. To free the nipples. Yeah, for them. That's insane. I got to look that up. That's crazy. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Because it's just fucking stupid. Like, I, I, I just, yeah. I can't stand it. I, it, like, really, truly pisses it me is, off to my actual core. It is, re it's really, it is really, really dumb. And we're one of the few countries that it is that way. Now, we know there are other countries that are that way as well. Mm -hmm. And even in this country, it's not everywhere in this country. There yeah. are certain places that. It, yeah, it, even it, Venice you know, Beach, I found out is actually technically legally a topless beach and I have been topless there I have been asked to put my shirt on but I haven't topless there <laughs> asked to put um, your shirt back on by who um it was actually for ecstatic dance and the ecstatic dance people asked me to put my shirt back on oh <laughs> which was stupid <laughs> but whatever that is, that is funny anyway <laughs> um so I so that feels really good just like in general I'm like a big free the nipple person and then also like I just, so much of my work, so much of my um, art, so much of my life is about like sexual freedom, sexual healing, sacred sexuality. I really like to use that term because for me, it's not just like this thing that is divorced from our like sense of like soul and spirit and essence and divine. And often it's like, because we're raised in a puritanical culture, it's like sex is associated with sin and holiness and godliness is associated with the other end of the spectrum and we don't like really talk about them meeting and for me it's so the opposite thing especially because so much of my spiritual enlightenment has come through tantra and has come through sexuality um, and sexual healing um, that it's just like a cornerstone of my work and being fully naked is really fucking liberating and like it doesn't have to be sexual actually right like in fact it's not inherently at all sexual right um and so there's another part of me that's like i am doing burlesque and i am doing things that are sensual but i'm also just like up here showing you that this doesn't even have to be sexual like i could just exist and we can just start to get comfortable with nudity and with being in the nude with each other without there being 
all of these charges and things that come up and da da da, da. and like I don't know I think most nudity is not sexual, sexual exactly at all. exactly um, and so like even my last song you know the other that I did fully nude the other day I didn't do a sexy song it was like one of my most soulful heartfelt songs about like being held and being home and being safe and that's the song that I chose to do fully in the nude because I wanted there to be like Yes, I am doing sensual songs. I am doing burlesque, but also like I'm still just like an artist and a human who is now just like stripped down to their core for you to have you feel these things with me. Like how raw and and like powerful is the ability to just like be naked with each other, literally and metaphorically. Um, so and I don't know why I was just born with freak codes. Also because like I just like being naked all the time, you know. So it's just like the more I think that's I can how be. we all are. At, really, I mean, yeah, our birthday suit is our favorite suit. Totally. And it's the one that we should cherish the most. But when we are uncomfortable with our birthday suit, like for me, at least in my past, when I was uncomfortable with how I looked and how I felt, that's when my body started to deteriorate because I didn't take as much pride yeah, in it. And I didn't totally. explore my own vanity. Totally. But the minute I the minute I started to celebrate myself as I was in that present moment, mm -hmm. that's when the change happened. Mm -hmm. I like, I'm very open about me doing my own um, self-portrait shoots. Yeah, I love them. That are in um, where most of them I am in a nude or yeah. barely clothed, mm -hmm. right? But most don't like they see my body as I am now and think that's why I I am doing it. But right, it started before that. Totally, totally, right? totally, totally. Well, well before that. It started before I really, uh, the change happened to me when it comes to in the gym, how I ate and intermittent fasting. But it was in that moment when I really celebrated, again, celebrated my body as it is in that present moment that the yeah. change happened. This is again why I am so big on vanity. Mm -hmm. I, definition of vanity is excessive celebration and one's appearance are career accomplishments, mm. right? But it's, no one should wait to get an award to celebrate their career. Yes. That, if they take pride in it, if they're happy, yes. and it's like, don't wait to get an award to celebrate what you've done, celebrate it in the present moment. Yes. No matter how big or small that, celebra that celebration is, or that achievement is, yep. celebrate it, yep. right? And it's the agree. same when it comes to us. No one should say we're beautiful louder than we say it. Yes. Or have to wait until we say, you know, absolutely, or somebody to Fucking validate agree. us, and then yeah. we see it all the time. People are constantly chasing a validation yeah. be before they actually bunker down themselves, before they actually celebrate who they are. Yep. Even yourself, when it comes to your music, all those years ago, mm -hmm. right? Like you were insecure about it because you were constantly comparing yourself to others and mm -hmm. wanted validation from them until you said, "Fuck that." Yeah. And it was like, "Oh no, I." think I'm awesome as I am yeah. is of course you strive to get better but right now I am awesome as I am yeah. and then you're able to release music you yeah. know you're able totally. to perform again to people who record your track and then mm -hmm. make the career shift so mm -hmm. yep totally agree vanity yeah. people yes agreed it's actually a, a positive thing yeah, so. I agree. Yeah, I was actually just talking about you the other day to a friend because I was referencing this and I was saying how much I love and see and appreciate that quality in you. And especially like Thank we you. do have, a, um, I feel like women are kind of culturally granted more space to like explore nude shoots and have it be kind of this thing that's considered like high art. Um, but I see so few men who like really enter that space with the kind of like self-confidence and still like it's um, it's. And you may not resonate with this word per se, I don't know, but it's like thinking of the, the self as sacred. And it just like carries this energy of being like unfuckable with and like beauty. And I just love it so much. And I like really want to see more people in general, but also specifically more men like take up space in that way. Oh, I agree. I think more men should. I mean, I, we can go on. This is a, yeah, yeah. We can go on and on and on about this, yeah. especially when you're talking about feminine energy, masculine mm -hmm. energy, how the reality is we have both of them mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. how men... I, I know why a lot of men probably don't do it because of like penis obsession, mm. you know, it's either you have to be yeah. big to show it or small and funny yeah. to show it. It's like mm. not in in between and it's 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 all just ridiculous. Yeah, and, agreed. And I know some people are looking at this and they're like, Skylar, you shut the fuck up. But hey, 
Still, I can <laughs> still have these opinions, people. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. This, is not, this does not mean what I'm saying is not true. It's valid. <laughs> because I belong in certain yep. categories, but still, it's totally like, agree. you know, yep. whatever. Yeah. It, like, celebrate your body. It's your body, and you only have one. Yeah. For now, you only yeah. have one. Yeah. Who knows what's coming down the pipeline. It does seem like people are going to start having multiple bodies, but yeah. until then. We got one so body. Celebrate it's a 10 it, it, Yeah. It maximize its capabilities. Exactly. What else would you like to cover? Um, let's see. I would like to just speak a little bit more into the album release because okay. I'm really Please. excited for this. Um, first of all, I'm so grateful to be living in LA now and so grateful to be working with incredible people and teams who are just like so passionate about like the vision because for me it's like this really isn't about me this album is not about me it's about the vision and like finding the right collaborators to make the vision come to life has been such a blessing um and i just connected with some amazing actually amazing people back from my home state in arizona are going to be coming out for my album release in march and someone who does like the most badass projection mapping and i'm a projection artist so while i perform i have my artwork projecting up while i'm performing and some of it's super psychedelic and trippy and yummy and others more like classic kind of like music video vibes um, but either way i've been doing it kind of like on my diy vibes and also like with a little bit of help and kind of like getting it better and better and better but i'm finally working with someone who's like you know just like the kind of projection mapper who can do any anything um and uh, I have like a team coming in to the, for the creative direction. Um, I have like special gifts for everyone. Everyone's gonna get a blindfold because we're gonna be blindfolded for some of the performance. Like, and th that's too, the thing too is like I'm really excited about the performance itself because for me, um, for me as an artist, and this is not true for everyone, for me as an artist, the days of just like performing for people are actually kind of over and people are more interested in having like experiences with you and co-creating with you. I personally know it to be true that everyone within an audience is co-creating the art, whether they're aware of it or not, because like I surrender Absolutely myself into being a channel and all of the energy is running through me and everyone who's present is a part of that. But I want to make it even more high key. Like I want people to be very aware of their role as a co-creator. And so like bringing people into like invitations for meditations, invitations at the last one we had like, I had people do, you know, like little group talks on this, this and that before we talked about the song, because I, I really do believe that like the art we get out of it as much as we put into it with anything, right? Like if you go and look at a book as opposed to read the book or as opposed to read the book and take notes or as opposed to read the book and talk about it and take notes or whatever, like you are going to get out of it as much as you put into it. And as an artist, oftentimes it's like we're expected to facilitate you really receiving the experience and the art and really hitting your soul and yada 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 and there's an extent to which that does happen naturally but there's another extent to which like you show up as a participant and decide that you're going to be so fucking present and so fucking engaged that you are going to have a transformative experience and that's what this album is really about in all of my work and all of my dharma <laughs> is like creating transformative experiences around healing and embodiment and specifically around like sensual healing and embodiment. Um, thank you. Um, and so um, I'm like asking my audience to show up to like do work with me, to not just like, yeah, you pay your money and I'm here to sing for you. It's like we're co-creating an experience. I'm facilitating, but we're all a part of it. And I want you to have a transformational experience. And the only way that's going to happen is if you commit to being present and engaging and participating. Do they have to commit and engage? So what I'm going to ask, and this is like pretty experimental. Um, I did it a little bit at my last show and it was successful, but I'm going to do it more high key this time for the actual release is there's lots of spaces at our enchanted lofts. We get areas where there's like big mansions where there's bedrooms or there's an outdoor space or whatever. So I, I'm going to request that anyone who would like to participate in the performance is in the room with me and anyone who does not, it's totally, totally okay. I love that for them, but to just go do that somewhere else so that they, if they want to connect with someone or talk or like decompress or whatever, they have so much space to do that. But like, if you're in the room with me, then we're doing work together. It's almost like I, I'm bringing my skill as like a teacher and also like my many, many, many past lives as like a shaman and a, and a spiritual facilitator into the room with me as a performer. And it's like, we are making something together. Your ticket is like your participation stamp. If you don't want to be here, that's fine. But this is what we're doing together. Um, so I'm just going to like really, and it's so fucking cool 
being a producer of Enchanted Lofts and being a producer where I get to make these demands and curations. Like I can't just go to a bar and tell everyone to shut up and like come, <laughs> come meditate with me or something. Um, that's not how it works. But if you're invited into that experience specifically and I'm curating that container, I get to do that. So that's super fucking exciting for me. Lovely. <laughs> 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 That's the thing that I just have to stop saying, right, is the word <laughs> lovely, fantastic, things of that sort, right? Because I'm just using it as a bridge to get, get to it. the uh, to the next thing. Yeah. Sam, yes. this has been phenomenal. I agree. Thank you very much for being here. And yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This has been a delight. I love chatting with you. And I'm really excited to connect more with your community and tap in that way. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.